Hi, my name is Steve Copeland and welcome to this first video on the Calvinism series. In this first video, we are going to firstly take a brief look at Acts 17 to establish the biblical view of God's sovereignty. Then we will present Calvin and John Piper's view and also present why educated atheists use Calvinist theology to justify hating the malevolent God that Calvinists present. I've often been asked if Calvinism is a different gospel. To be honest, considering the fact that the word gospel means good news, then I would suggest that the doctrines of Tulip, which is only good news to those who are predetermined to salvation, is not a gospel at all. One of the most fundamental doctrines of Calvinists is that no creature can ever act outside of God's sovereign will. This doctrine has very serious implications regarding God's character, his purpose in creating humanity, and who can be saved. When we speak of God's will, we mean that God is all-powerful and that he has, and always has had, a plan all throughout the Bible. However, the Bible also states that human beings must make choices, real choices, and that these choices will affect us both in this life and our eternal destiny. Therefore, one of the foundations of God's sovereign plan is that those made in God's image have the freedom to choose to seek Him, to find Him, and enter into a relationship with Him through His convicting them of sin and trusting in Him by faith, and of course, calling Him through general revelation. A passage of Scripture which speaks of God's sovereignty and plan, but is seldom quoted by Calvinists, is in Acts 17, verses 24 to 28. Paul was visiting Athens at the time, and he was shocked at the amount of idols in the city. He was taken to a meeting of the Europagus on Mars Hill, where he spoke to these pagan Athenians. And he said this, the God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples made by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. Verse 26. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth and he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own prophets have said, we are his offspring. Now here we have a beautiful picture of God's sovereignty, giving every person life and breath and everything else, determining where and when we will live. And his sovereign plan was that we would seek him, perhaps reach out to him and find him, although he is not far from any one of us. Paul is speaking to pagans, and he's telling them why they were created. And notice that Paul continually uses the word everyone and every one of us and they. Paul's theology was that knowing the Lord was available to every person, for God has revealed himself, his eternal power and divine nature to every person so that we would seek him and that we are without excuse. Romans 1, 18-21. Calvinists seldom quote these verses from Acts because they totally contradict their theology that no one can seek God until he regenerates us, a topic we will explore in the next video. They love to quote Romans chapter 3 and verse 11 where Paul is quoting a psalm of David which begins with the words, The fool says in his heart there is no God. Indeed, Paul in the previous chapter has already spoken of Gentiles who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honor, and immortality. This is Romans chapter 2. Paul was no fool, and the Spirit of God would never inspire him to contradict himself. My point is simple. It is a foundational part of God's plan 
that all of those he has given life and breath and everything else and established where and when they would live, that these would seek him, reach out to him, and perhaps find him. Even Calvinists have great difficulty twisting these words to fit their theology that no one can seek, so they simply don't mention them. Why? Because they contradict their cherry-picked version of God's sovereignty. So what is the Calvinist view of God's sovereignty? Calvinists insist that God and God alone chooses who will be saved and that this choice is predetermined by God. No Calvinist has any clue about how this choosing is done. Indeed, Calvin himself said it was by God's secret counsel, an idea made up by the man. A favorite verse used is, Jacob I have loved and Esau I have hated, a verse which has nothing whatsoever to do with predeterminism. Calvin stated the following, All are not created on equal terms, but some are preordained to eternal life, others to eternal damnation, and, accordingly, as each has been created for one or other of these ends, we say that he has been predestined to life or death. John Calvin, Institutes for the Christian Religion, Book 3 and Chapter 21. Those who are preordained to eternal life are the elect, the chosen, and only this chosen few will be spared from eternal conscious torment in hell. No person can change this destiny. According to Calvinism, If you are one of the chosen, you cannot choose to reject God, and if you are not one of the chosen, no amount of repentance or seeking or faith will change God's mind. And as we shall see in the next video, because they lay this foundation, they have to say you have to be born again before you can even seek. So God has his secret counsel, or he rolls a dice, or he has a divine lottery. And if you won the lottery, you're in. And if not, you're doomed. I call this Solar Luck Torah, by luck alone. And yes, this doctrine applies to newborn babies, to little children, and even those in the womb from the time of conception. In Calvin's words, we all deserve to be thrown into hell because we inherited Adam's sin and are guilty of Adam's sin. In Calvin's words again, All are involved in original sin and polluted by its stain. Hence, even infants, bringing their condemnation with them from their mother's womb, suffer not for another's, but for their own defect. For although they have not yet produced the fruits of their own unrighteousness, they have the seed implanted in them. Nay, their whole nature is, as it were, a seedbed of sin and therefore cannot be but odious and abominable to God. Institutes of the Christian Religion, Book 2.8 I guess Jesus never got that memo. According to Calvin, all children are conceived guilty and are odious, this is the word repulsive, and an abomination to God. Why do I say Jesus didn't get this memo? Well, according to Calvin, Jesus should have said, Keep these foul children away from me, for they are repulsive and an abomination. Frankly, I find Calvin's words a total defamation of Christ and an abomination. But wait, if having only a tiny chance of winning the divine lottery wasn't bad enough, Calvinists are so determined to paint God as an angry, unjust, and hate-filled tyrant that they teach we are all like robot puppets in a divine game and God controls every single human decision. Consider this statement by celebrity Calvinist John Piper. He, that is God, is sovereign over every single human decision. We have all kinds of thinking that we do, but in the end, the Lord decides. About God's sovereignty, it is unstoppable power and authority over all things, including the human will. This is on a YouTube video with John Piper 
from DesiringGod.org, an interview that he had. The implications of this statement are horrendous. God, for Piper, does not allow every human decision, but he actively wills every human decision. The difference in these statements is defined by stating that humans have no freedom to choose, in which case God wills the rapist, the murderer, the child molester, the drunk driver, the holocaust, the terrorist, the adulterer, the fornicator, etc. All of this is absolutely true if we believe, as Piper claims, in the end the Lord decides. Calvinists such as Gordon Clark teach exactly this and stated that if a man murders his wife and children, God willed those actions. I cannot think of anything which defames the character of the Lord I love more than this absolute Calvinist defamation of the character of Christ. If one points out this defamation of God, they are told the classic Reformed answer, you don't understand Calvinism. Such a response always comes from a person who cannot reconcile the blatant contradictions of what he believes against revealed biblical truth. If human beings have no free will, as Calvinists emphatically insist, and God controls the human will, as Piper claims, then the following interpretation by educated atheists who understand Calvinism is sadly very accurate. This is the way atheists see God through a Calvinist lens. Before he created the world, God decided to create human beings with no real freedom of choice and planted within them a desire for sin which none could resist. Indeed, every person born inherited the guilt of Adam's sin and is under God's wrath from conception. He also gave them powerful sexual desires in order that they might create as many humans as possible in order to satisfy his desire to enjoy human suffering for all eternity, those who were predestined to eternal torment and torture. He gave humanity laws that they could not obey, and he forced his will upon them so that they couldn't obey, and he allowed millions of demonic beings to assist him in getting humans to commit atrocities so that he had a justifiable case for punishing them. He also created hell, a place of eternal torture and torment, a place without hope of release through non-existence. This malevolent being could only satisfy his lust for suffering by giving his creatures an immortal soul, one which could not be destroyed. However, in order to appear benevolent and merciful, he randomly chose about 5% of humanity to enjoy paradise with him, while the 95% scream in agony for all eternity. Now, other atheists have taken this point even further, pointing out the following logical assumptions from Calvinist theology. No person ever asked to be born, and God gave them his command of an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth, and a life for a life. Yet God breaks his own standard of justice, for he demands eternal torment for 70 years of disobedience, a disobedience which could never have been otherwise. Indeed, when God decided to send Jesus to deceive people that they may have some chance of winning the divine lottery, his own son only had to suffer for a few hours in comparison to the creatures he made and predestined to hell. Atheists often summarize this view with, this is the God that we are commanded to love and worship. Now, I apologize for presenting this view here, but this is exactly the way that atheists present this view of God. In reality, Jesus healed every person who came to him. He turned no one away. This does not mean that everybody receives salvation. He fed two large crowds of people, and he delighted to have children come to him, and he called people to faith. If, as Calvinists claim, the Father had already predetermined most of these people to eternal conscious torment in hell, then Jesus was playing the part of a deceiver. Such is the only logical conclusion. But then Calvinists will comment, you don't understand Calvinism. 
Sadly, I understand it only too well. Indeed, I did one of my postgraduate dissertations on God's sovereignty and human responsibility. But I will leave the final word to A.W. Tozer from his book, The Knowledge of the Holy. God sovereignly decreed that man should be free to exercise moral choice, and man from the beginning has fulfilled that decree by making his choice between good and evil. When he chooses to do evil, he does not thereby countervail the sovereign will of God, but rather fulfills it, inasmuch as the eternal decree decided not which choice the man should make, but that he should be free to make it. If in his absolute freedom God has willed to give man limited freedom, who is there to stay his hand or say, What doest thou? Man's will is free because God is sovereign. A God less sovereign could not bestow moral freedom upon his creatures. He would be afraid to do so. This is taken from A.W. Tozer in his book, The Knowledge of the Holy. In the next video, I want to offer a refutation to this Calvinist idea of regeneration that is being born again, preceding faith, and perhaps even ask the question, is regenerate Calvinist an oxymoron? The reason I say that is simply this, that if a person does not understand what regeneration is or don't know the difference between revelation and regeneration, or believe that even Abel and Cain were regenerate, then have they ever experienced regeneration themselves? These are some of the questions we will look at, and I will offer five different biblical points as why this doctrine is absolutely false. Please remember to like and subscribe, but more importantly, please share this video with people who are trapped in Calvinism and don't understand what the scriptures really teach on these issues. Thank you for watching, and God bless.